Um, hi, so yes, I am Steve. Can you hear me at, at the back? Can you hear me? You? Yes, excellent, cool. I'll probably keep doing this. So if I do wave or something. Um, so this talk is also called The Good, The Bad, and The Squishy, not just that really long one that's in the program, because that sounded very confusing and very technical to me, and I thought, wow, that's cool. I can sound like I'm really smart and stuff. But then I thought maybe I should make it sound like other people apart from me could understand it. Um, the point of the whole talk is going to be about squishy things. Um, you could say, instead of squishy, you could say wibbly wobbly. Um, you could say flaxy. You could say adaptive, um, changey, or, or something like that. Um, but screen size is just one part of it, and that's what I'll be talking about a lot for the first uh, bit. Um, and I guess the, my call to action is to uh, have everyone think about designing stuff in a more squishy way. So not just to sit in like this, but to think about how it's going to wobble and move across uh, various bits and pieces. That URL at the top um, is a link to a bunch of links, which kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, and the top one is a link to these slides. But all the rest are um, all about progressive enhancement and mobile first and responsive and all these kind of things. Um, it's about 20, 30 links. And I've kept it to stuff from, I think, this year. Because if I started linking everything, it would have been about 3,000 long. And that feels a, bit, a, bit, a little bit excessive. Um, as Iggy said, that's my Twitter handle. If you know about the internet, um, you can find me there. Um, and my job, as of very recently, Wednesday, in fact, as of Wednesday, is front-end developer at uh, Prekelt. Um, Prekelt is a company that creates mobile experiences for the majority world, he said, following the company line. Um, so what that means is we do webby stuff, but we also do a lot of stuff with USSD and SMS and stuff around Africa, not just in, in South Africa. Um, I thought I'd just start quickly by talking about what a front-end developer is, since that's me, and maybe it's not entirely clear it's not clear to me sometimes. Um, so here's an incredibly simplified diagram. Uh, Back-end developer, front-end developer, designer. So I'm lumping all things design in with designers just to kind of make it slightly easier for me. Um, in the beginning, there was the web, and it was good. And there are developers, and they were very happy. They were sitting in their little cave, blinking lights going off in the corner, uh, empty cans of Red Bull strewn across the floor. Um, and they were making all of these websites, and they were happy, and it was great. Um, then one day somebody said, hey, human beings are using these sites. Maybe we should get someone with some design skills involved so that you know, it's usable and that it looks good. Um, so then there were developers and designers. Um, but there were a bit of a Mexican standoff kind of thing going on, because they didn't really speak the same language, and they didn't really want to talk to each other, and it was all, it was all quite horrible. And then at some point, some kind of uh, unholy alliance between the two formed. And this was a front-end developer. So someone who kind of does some development and does some design, and it's, it's, it's all kind of a bit in the middle. And the overlap varies. So as you'll see from my slides, I'm much more towards the developer side than the designy side. But you get some people who are basically designers but have a lot of coding skills. So it depends. This is what I'm going to talk about, apart from going very dry in the throat. Uh, three big things. The biggest list of things, uh, progressive enhancement, which is the thing that makes me feel good on the inside. Um, talk a bit about responsive as well, because, you know, hashtag buzzword and all that kind of thing. Um, and then at the end, we'll talk a little bit about uh, deliverables, squishy ones, obviously. Um, I'm going to try to stop saying um as well. What I won't talk about is workflow, because that's a whole thing on its own, and that's or very complicated. And I'm not going to talk about tools, because actually I kind of feel like it doesn't matter. You can use what you want as long as you can get the job done and you're happy. So that's, that's kind of how I feel. Um, progressive enhancement. Does anyone know, have a kind of a vague idea of what it is? Yay, nay. Good, a smattering of hands. This pleases me. Um, so, and I did this next slide a couple of days ago. So um, it's, it's nice that it fits in with the theme of the conference. But this is how Progressive enhancement makes me feel on the inside. <laughs> you, can you can choose whether you think, oh, I think I'm the cat or the unicorn. It's, it's not important. Um, or the Nyan cat hiding in the background there. Um, but, so what is it all about, apart from unicorns, obviously? 
Um, it's about dealing with diversity and it's about dealing with unknowns in terms of browsers hitting websites. Um, so apart from cartoon cats, what, is that, what do I actually mean by that? So progressive enhancement is about building a baseline that works everywhere and, and is, is good and then enhancing it by adding stuff on top. Um, it's about building a tasty cake burger of a website rather than just building a website. I did actually look on Cake Rex and that for an actual cake burger or burger cake picture, but it was just too horrific and it would have put everybody off their lunch. So we're, we're going with a regular burger. Sorry to the vegetarians. Or that, that may be a soy burger. I'm not actually sure. Um, and the way that progressive enhancement works is by asking questions of the browser. So I'll get into it in the, the technical kind of bits a little bit later on. But it, it says, hey, do you understand this particular bit of JavaScript stuff? Cool. Have this bit of JavaScript stuff. Hey, do you understand this bit of CSS stuff? Cool. Take this bit of CSS stuff. That was a kick, CSS kick. Um, and the important thing is you start with functional and you build up to fancy by adding in your tomato and cheese and, and stuff. Or, well, not actual tomato and cheese. That'd be weird. Um, okay. So we should probably think about this in terms of what does a web page, how is it actually made? What are, what are the pieces that make up a web page? So you can start thinking about how do we layer on these, these blobby bits. So it starts in ancient Egypt. Wait, that's, no, that's not right. Um, so this is kind of what a web page looks like. Uh, at the bottom, you've got your HTML, your structured content. This is the, the, the base. This is where it all begins. Um, and then on top of that, layering on, you've got your CSS, which is your uh, presentation layer. And it's completely separate. See, there's a black line. Um, so it's, it's there, and they work together, but they are actually separate things. Um, and then at the top, a little tiny triangle, um, is the JavaScript bit. Um, the problem with the JavaScript bit is it layers on all the fancy interaction-y things and the behavior and stuff, but it's also the most fragile part. So somebody fixes, fixes something um, at midnight the night before, uh, and then you go to the website, and then basically all the JavaScript is broken. And this can happen and has happened, not to me, obviously, but uh, to other people that I've heard about. Um, <laughs> So it's important in terms of progressive enhancement not to rely on the JavaScript because it's so fragile, because you or someone else can break it very easily. Um, one of the things that people uh, often say is that, oh, but um, we can rely on JavaScript, right? Everybody has it turned on in their browser all the time. Most people don't even know how to turn it off. And well, yeah, that's kind of true. Um, but there's a quote which I'm going to uh, attempt and get wrong, which is that all of your users are non-JavaScript users while your JavaScript is loading. You hit a web page and you want to start poking stuff and the JavaScript is still downloading. So if your website is built in a way that relies on the JavaScript to do, to do basic tasks, then you're screwed. Oh, almost said naughtier word there, that was close. <laughs> um, so let's, let's look at um, a specific small blobby bit to, to think about this in, more, in terms of more squishy stuff. So here is the humble button yesterday uh, in its native environment. Um, the one at the top is an HTML button. No CSS, straight out of the box. Um, it's not very exciting, is it? But it's a button, and it works. And you can click it, and it will do stuff, which is nice. Um, the second one is, let's, let's put a little bit of CSS in there. Uh, not, not a lot of CSS, obviously. Um, but it's done to look better. And then at the bottom, we've got my uh, Web 2.0 special. Uh, <laughs> rounded corners, drop shadow, um, fancy font, text shadow too. And top it all off, a little bit of a gradient. Nice. Um, <laughs> but, and it's a big but, um, as Sir Mixalot would be very happy about, um, it's granular. So it comes in pieces. The fancy font is a piece. The text shadow is a piece. The drop shadow is a piece. And all of these can kind of succeed or fail depending on the browser. So it's not like it's a straight kind of run down. Either you are kind of dull or you're super fancy and it's just step by step. It's all in these pieces. So a browser might say, cool, let me take the fancy font. I don't know about rounded corners or gradients, so I'm going to ignore all of that. But I'm going to take the fancy font. Or it might say, oh, gradients, shiny stuff. Uh, fonts, nah, not for me, thanks. Move along here. Um, so that, that's the, the squishy bit of this is the, the granularly squishy. Is granularly a word? Granularness, granulosity, granular. I'm going to go with granular. Uh, the granularness is uh, the individual bits of the button. Okay, right. 
Let's look at a, a slightly bigger than one tiny thing example. Um, the text is very small, sorry. Um, but this is an example of a uh, property listing from a popular website building company, Filament Group, in Boston, uh, which I've never been to, but oh, it's nice. It's very nice. Um, so the top left one is the beginning one. They, what they want to do is add a map to a property listing. So the basic one, the kind of HTML with a little bit of CSS, has the picture, the property details, and then a button that you click to go to another page, which is the Google map. That works, right? That's If you want to view a map of where this property is, that, that works. That's great. Now, if we want to get a little bit fancy, we can use some JavaScript to say, hey, go get that Google map and bring it over here. Stick it under the property listing so it's right there. You can see it straight away. Nice. Very nice. Um, then, if the browser also understands fancy CSS, you know what? Let's, let's, let's turn up the fancy pants here. Let's be capped in fancy pants, in fact, and load it behind the listing, and then when they click the button, it goes, whoa, whoa. And then it appears, it's, oh, it's amazing. And then, oh, they want to go back, click, whoa, whoa, and you go back to the listing. So it's this kind of stepped approach to being fancy pants. Does that kind of make sense? St stepping fancy pants, okay, good, I'll remember that. Um, here's a graph from this morning, which is why it's uh, not very high resolution. Um, I was gonna try and put text on this, but it kept looking, well, basically really shit, so I'm just going to explain it instead. Um, the bottom line, going from left to right, is um, browser capabilities. So how new or how smart is the browser? Does it understand all of the, the fancy pants stuff you want to do? And then on the, on the y-axis, for the more mathematically minded, um, going from bottom to top is fidelity. I, I keep trying to find a better word for this, but I suppose fancy pants is the word I'm looking for. Um, and you'll notice that it's not a straight line. It's not as simple as saying newer browser means better capabilities means more fancy. There's this kind of wobbling thing that we talked about with the button. So some things get better and some things get worse and it's kind of wop, 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 like that. Also, I like dots. Dots are kind of cool. So I'm going to attempt an analogy um, for uh, building up progressive enhancement. Right? So let's say, in this mystical, magical world of my head, um, that you want to get from a ground floor to the first floor of a building. Anyone ever been in a building? Anyone understand? The, no, no. Okay, so in that case, the HTML, the kind of the contenty bit, is just the stairs. Not very fancy looking stairs, but you know, stairs. I can walk up them to get to ground floor, first floor, awesome. Um, okay, so what about the CSS, the, pres the presentation layer now? Boom. This is a uh, from my house and observatory. Um, <laughs> but the nice thing is, the CSS, the presentation, is completely separate, right? It doesn't matter what the stairs look like. You can still walk up them to get ground floor, first floor. Sweet. So, JavaScript, behavior, interaction, um, extra, extra swishiness, if you like. Oh, cool. Ground floor, first floor, no problem. I can sit here checking Twitter as I go from one floor to another. Very nice. But um, if you're thinking about it like this, what, what happens when the JavaScript fails? What happens when somebody uh, decides at midnight to rewire those two wires? Because, you know, it was looking a bit messy, so let me just, just change them. Uh, and it's like, uh, oh, actually, that's not so bad. The, it just stops. We were never relying on the JavaScript to get us from the ground floor to the first floor. We, it was just an enhancement, a uh, progressive enhancement. Um, so it was great. We weren't relying on the JavaScript. We just it it was fancier. That was all. Um, so you compare this to if you were doing approaching the same problem in a different way. You want to get ground floor to the first floor in an elevator. Ha! Cool. Right. JavaScript to make it move up and down. Awesome. Twiddle with the wires at uh, at midnight. Wake up the next morning. Ah! <laughs> Not so good. I can't move anymore. Um, has anyone ever been stuck in an elevator? Actually, really? Wow. That's quite a lot. Um, I thought it was like the movies, you know, like with cars exploding. It happens all the time, but in real life, it's only once every, every year, I think. Um, oh, cool. Well, was it terrible? Was it hor horrific? Oh, I'm so sorry. Oof. No? V varying levels of horror. Okay. So, like lots of questions about software, the answer is always, it depends. Um, and there are levels of optimization that you can apply. So... 
you don't, of, of course, you're not going to spend six months of uh, development time making everything exactly the same everywhere, especially you know that older versions of Internet Explorer are going to screw you over, so you, you're not going to spend weeks and weeks fixing it and making it perfect. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't spend a little bit of time optimizing for the, for the good ones as well. That's, that sentence made no sense, did it? Let me think about it a different way. Um, fast is better than fancy. So, I'm oh, certainly losing my track here. Okay, uh, let me have a water break. <coughs> How's that? Um, it's slightly warmer on stage. If anyone wants to get uh, out of the chill zone, just come and sit over here. It's, it's quite nice. Um, Okay, let me, let me move on to this. It seems I seem to have forgotten what I wanted to say about the optimization. Let me move on to the other one instead and pretend that that was it. Um, cutting the mustard uh, is a, an English phrase, which means being good enough, right? Um, and the BBC news crew in the United Kingdom um, have done this thing. They've used this technique that they're calling cutting the mustard to, to draw a line in the sand and say, okay, we want to do this kind of fancy stuff. If we use this newer version of the tech, we can do it much quicker. We can write this much code. If we want to have that exact same thing in all of these older browsers that don't understand the new tech, we've got to write this much code. So they've got to download all of this extra guff just to get the sodding carousel. No, forget that. Let's just send them a simple version. Let's send them HTML and CSS because it's the news. They have come to read words and look at pictures. They don't need to see the carousel. That's cool. If your browser is newer and fancier, We'll send you the small bit of code which gives you the fancy stuff. Seems reasonable. And this this idea, all kind of all of this squishiness and uh, making everyone happy for me feeds into this idea of the one web of giving everybody who has an internet connected device access to your stuff, regardless of the device they're using, um, the connection they're on, or any disabilities they might have. So if somebody wants to look at pictures of cats and unicorns, it's like, well. Why shouldn't they? Why, why should you punish them um, just because they happen to have a slightly older, crappier cell phone? Um, and you shouldn't, obviously. Uh, well, not obviously, I guess. Um, but as you can see, this introduces lots of unknowns. You, know, you, you can't say, everyone is going to be using the Samsung S3 on my website. I can code it and test it in that, and it's going to be perfect, because it won't. And you don't know if someone is going to be on a flaky conference Wi-Fi or, oh, did I say that out loud? Um, <laughs> Or on a super fast LTE in the middle of the city center. You know, you, you don't know. And you don't know if they're a, a sighted user or if they've got poor motor skills. You know, you've got to uh, build for all of these things that you don't know. You, you don't know way more than you do know if you do do what I say mean. Mm. So that was all about a bunch of squishy stuff. Um, the main squishy thing was fidelity. The, f the squishiness is the fidelity of the experience. It's not just this kind of, it slowly goes up, it's also kind of wobbly, and it's, it's all kind of, it's wibbly wobbly. It's a good, it's good word, I'm gonna use that one again. And also the squishiness was in the browser capabilities. You know, how new or how fancy is your phone or tablet or computer? That changes the way that your website will be displayed quite a lot. Okay, let's move on to hashtag responsive. Um, so responsive web design, and that is an actual Twitter handle that you can go and uh, look at for various bits of news and links and things. Um, has anyone heard of responsive web design? Yes, good. It's three people. Good, good, good. Um, <laughs> so it's made up of, of three bits, and I've written this down because I always get it wrong. Um, a fluid grid, so your layout is kind of wibbly wobbly. Um, flexible images because you're going over screen sizes, so you want to make it kind of squishy. Um, and media queries, which are a CSS thing, which basically lets um, the CSS ask questions of the browser about the size and shape of the viewport. Like, are you big, are you small, are you somewhere in between? I don't know. Um, so, so the squishy bit is about the layout. So the simplest one is number of columns, you know. Um, on a big desktop monitor, you might have the four columns, and then on a tablet, it might go down to two, and then on a phone, it might go down to one. Squish out. Um, but one of the important things to keep in mind is that it's about proportions, not pixels. So because you're doing something squishy, if you're doing it in pixels all the time, you're kind of like, okay, 320, and then 340, and then, and then 360, and then 380, no, 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 no. If it's in percentages, then it just it wobbles much more easily. Um, and one, one of common misconception that I uh, come across with responsive stuff is that it's not about doing this. Uh, it's... <laughs> 
I mean, that's, that's kind of... Does anyone actually do this, apart, apart from me? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Is it responsive? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, but it is about a little bit more than that, honestly. It's, it's much more about this. So I've just done a couple, um, but the, the range is obviously much bigger. So on the far side there, uh, kind of just past the pay fast sign, um, you've got things like, tiny things like uh, Apple Watch and the Galaxy Gear um, and Google Glass. Okay, Glass, take a picture. Um, and then on this side, you've got things like smart TVs. And it's also, I mean, I've just drawn a couple of thingies, but it's actually a continuum, right? Especially this bit between S and M. Wait, let me not say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Awkward. Uh, okay, delete picture, delete picture, good, good. Um, you've, you've got uh, the new Apple Uber phones. Um, well, the, the larger, larger phones. And tablets seem to be getting smaller or, or dying out. So, you know, the 10-inch kind of size is not really there, but they're like five, six, seven is okay. And if anyone says phablet, I will cut you. <laughs> um, but you're getting this kind of big-ish smartphone is, is the new thing, right? Um, and the borders are blurry. Like I was saying, the tablets are getting smaller, phones are getting bigger. What does it become? Nobody knows. I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. And then it gets even more complicated because... It's not like people use one thing the whole time. You know, you walk, you go to the bus stop, you stand, you check Facebook, <laughs> cat. Um, you get to work, and then you uh, maybe check Facebook some more. And it's you're using multiple screens uh, throughout the day. And then it's even more, more complicated. Uh, uh, people also use multiple screens. You're um, sitting on the couch watching Netflix or something. It's like, hey, I know that Actron. Where have I seen them before? Boop, boop, boop. Ah, cop number seven, of course. Um, so basically what I'm saying is it's complicated, and this is giving me a headache, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on to the next one. Um, mobile first. So this actually came before responsive. So responsive web design was maybe 2010-ish, and but then Luke, was Luke Rublu, Lu, wait, Rublevsky, Rublevsky, and I can say this because I practiced this morning with my Polish wife. And, and she says it means like finch or sparrow. So he's kind of like Luke Elbijewski or something like that, I don't know. Um, but he was talking about mobile as a way of focusing, you know, designing for small screens on crappy networks and stuff gives you very tight constraints, so it makes you focus a lot. Um, so then after a while, people started saying, hey, what if we combine these two ideas, this mobile first winningness and this responsive web design? Um, and when you do that, and you start design small screen and then get bigger and get bigger and get bigger, you start to think, wait, isn't that kind of like progressive enhancement for screen sizes? And I would say, you're right. That's exactly what it is. I feel very strongly about this. And then things started to get complicated. So then it's like, oh, mobile first. Wait, hang on. What about content first? Because actually, people come to websites for the content. So content is the most important thing. So should, we should do that first. And then people are like, wait, no. Structure first. Because we don't... For now, we can't get the actual content. We just need to know the shape of it. You know, is it a heading and three paragraphs, or is it kind of a heading and an image, or what's going on? And then, as some CAD said on Twitter the other day, um, watches first. Hey, <laughs> uh, <laughs> honestly. A and so now people are saying, no, no, thumbs first. Uh, I was like, okay, well, that kind of makes sense, but sounds slightly rude. Um, and then um, the, the Devi side of things are saying, no, no, performance first. You know, the most important thing is a fast website. Fast Trump's fancy, right? People want their stuff now. When do we want it? Um, whenever the network's ready, I guess. It's fine. Yeah. So that was more squishy things. That was a bit of a uh, 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 through responsive land. Um, but we talked more about, well, I talked more. Sorry, I'm talking. Anyone else want to talk for a minute? <laughs> no? Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so that was squishiness in terms of uh, size of screens and squishiness in terms of layout. So I only really talked about, say, going f uh, column numbers, but obviously you can do a lot more fancy stuff, like that slide. Where was it? There, yeah, that one. You can do a lot more kind of uh, shuffling around and that kind of thing. Layout can be extremely squishy. So that's something to keep in mind when you're designing stuff. It's, it's hard. It's very difficult. Um, and things are a lot more squishy than you might at first think. So... Deliverables. The deliverables. It sounds like a film. Maybe it's a new Clint Eastwood film. Um, deliverables, yes. Right. Mock-ups in the, your tool of choice. Photoshop. 
um, or, or whatever you prefer. So, so static stuff, Photoshop and, and or Illustrator or Sketch or whatever you prefer, it does have its place. But the problem is a full page comp like this is not squishy. It's, it's the opposite of squishy. It's the unsquishy. Un is unsquishy a word? Unsquishy. It's unsquishy. Um, and it's a little bit, it feels, it feels kind of wrong to be designing these big static things when that's almost nothing like what the final uh, website is going to look like, right? So I'm going to uh, run through a couple of different uh, deliverably like things that one could use. Uh, style tiles. Has anyone seen or used style tiles? Aren't they awesome? They're pretty awesome, I think. So uh, this, is, this is kind of what they look like. They are related to, they're the cousin of full page comps. They're bits and pieces. So while at the one side you might have, um, if you're trying to establish a design direction, you might have a mood board, which can be kind of vague and kind of hand wavy. It's like, yeah, kind of like this. And then at the other end, you've got your mock-up, which is extremely precise. Th this kind of finds a nice middle ground. So you do bits and pieces. You grab a heading, you grab a couple of paragraphs, you grab a couple of images, you kind of throw them around. You don't do it like a page. It's supposed to look not like a page. It's supposed to not look like a page. It's supposed to be this kind of squishy, squishy. And then you can see in the bottom right here, hopefully, you often put uh, like a couple of adjectives with it, you know, like corporate, fluffy, cheesy, um, or, or whatever feels appropriate. So this is a great graphic design uh, deliverable thing to start kind of playing with. If you kind of take the next step from there and say, okay, well, if we take that and then we try and do some of the codes to it, what do we do? Um, you might look at something like a front end style guide or variously called this or pattern library or, or all these kind of things. Thanks, Rich. Um, and these are great. They're like, like traditional style guides, but done in code. So you can see exactly how the bits and pieces are going to look and then put it straight into your application or website. And it's like, oh, it looks, it looks the same. That's great. Cool. Um, so if you are kind of looking at front-end style guides and poking at them and doing that kind of thing, it might lead you on to atomic design from Mr. Uh, Bradley Frost. Actually, I think it's just Brad. Let's call him Brad. It sounds nice. But um, so he came up with this idea of splitting things up like this. But you can see even he got a bit bored. Kind of like atoms, yeah, molecules, yeah, organisms. Uh, I don't know, trees? No, no, it doesn't work. Uh, dugongs. Manatees? No, wait. Uh, uh, let's just call it templates and pages. It'll be fine. Um, but the idea behind it is great. It's the idea that you build stuff and you design stuff in components. You know, you start in pieces and then you make bigger and bigger pieces. So let's, um, let's look at a, an example because I don't think it's entirely clear. It gives me a bit of a headache. The humble login form, as perhaps seen on many internet websites. So a, an atom in this case would be a field. Just the field for, say, email and password. That field, that's an atom. Or just the label, the, the words that say email, put your email here, or, or something similar. A molecule then is combining a couple of atoms. So in this case, it would be email address and the box or password and the box. And then an organism would be the whole thing, or the, the whole thing that you see here. Um, I haven't drawn the, uh, the manatee. Um, couldn't, wouldn't have been uh, able to fit it into scale, so I hope that's okay. Um, and then if you, so going on from there, if you're looking at front-end style guides, and then you're looking at atomic design, you're going, oh yeah, uh, components, pieces, uh, let's put them all together, that's really cool, I like that. You might start changing the way that the dev process goes. You start with these pieces. You start by designing components, and you start by designing things for usability. You, you think about it, if you come from the other side, you do the whole page, and you put a whole bunch of stuff in it, you might find yourself redoing things. But say you've got a, a very long form, for instance, you know, you kind of just put it all in there and poke it around a bit. But if you start at the, the atom level, you design a field, and you start thinking, okay, I'm about to do this page with 17 other fields in it. How, how should I fiddle with this to make this work everywhere? How can I reuse it properly? That was some more squishy things. You know, hopefully you're noticing a bit of a theme here. Um, and not just that I'm using the same picture every time. That's on purpose, totes. Um, so the squishy things here were graphical stuff. The graphic design deliverables that you um, can use need to start becoming more squishy because the internet is squishy. Um, and code can also be squishy. You can try and do it in this kind of modular small pieces way so that you can combine and recombine and, and shuffle around and, and and juggle, uh, although probably not with uh, actual technology, because that could go horribly wrong. Um, so that's what we did. That was that felt like it went by very fast, but uh, maybe it didn't. Uh, progressive enhancement, squishy. Responsive web design, squishy. Deliverables, anybody? 
fist. Thank you, very good. Um, and that's it. Shot. Uh, like a squishy. All the links, presentation, all the things. Uh, harass me at Max Barnes on Twitter. Thanks. Uh, just before we cross over to some questions with Max Barnes, um, just an announcement from security to the driver of Alpha CA, I feel so weird doing this, Alpha CA733104, um, you're kind of standing in the wrong bay and you need to park in the right bay, something like that. So yeah, there's something around, yeah, Baywatch, Baywatch yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just going to cross over to some Q&A some Q with, with Steve, any questions? Cool. Um, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, I was just wondering, what are your feelings on um, graceful degradation versus progressive enhancement? No. Progressive enhancement is the better way to go, right? Because you start at the base level. So you start by ensuring that as many people as possible get, get your stuff. They get a functional experience, and they hopefully get a fast experience. It might not be fancy, but they get it. And then you layer on the extra bits. Going the other way around, you're, kind of, you're starting with the wrong assumptions. You know, you're starting by saying, cool, let's give them all the things. And then it's kind of harder to figure out, well, okay, well, what do we drop when? You know, do we... It's approaching it by saying, what do we do when stuff breaks, rather than saying, let's build it up in a way so that we don't care whether it breaks. Bits will just not be loaded or, or not be shown if browsers don't support that thing. Does that kind of make sense? Cool. Hi there. Uh, this is a bit more of a devil's advocate question and should be thought of as fun more than anything else. but. HTML itself is a moving beast, so your expression of it in your talk is that it's the base that keeps everything happy in your progressive enhancement model, but what happens if I wanted to use like the progress HTML tag? Um, yeah, how would you handle that? M, good question. Uh, well, if you do it with progressive enhancement, what you might want to do is rather load in the progress thing with JavaScript, because JavaScript lets you do the test to say, hey, do you know about this progress thing? Because it's kind of cool. And the browser says, pro what now? And you go, okay, cool. Don't worry about it. Just, just have the one out of three. That's good enough for you. Um, but some, some stuff fails more easily, like input type email or something like that. You use that, and if the browser supports it, they get the keyboard changes, and they get to input an email correctly. And if it doesn't, it falls back to text, so you're you're fine. That you always you're always coming back to the, the functional baseline thing. Is it okay? But like old mutual, where the the, you know, the network uh, sysadmin person is like, no, you may use nothing except exactly what I say. So you say to them, hey, upgrade, and they, I, I can't, I, I can't do anything. Um, or maybe it's somebody in an internet cafe on a crappy, really old crappy machine, and if you try and upgrade a browser there, the whole thing's just going to explode and fss, and it's. It's not going to be pretty. Um, but the idea is that if you're building it in the progressive enhancement kind of way, you actually you shouldn't care what browser they're using. You know that they're going to get the functional fast experience. No, but I sound like I'm repeating myself. Um, the, they get, you know, they, it's going to work for them. It's not going to be fancy, um, but it will work. So you shouldn't ideally, of course, because it depends, ideally you shouldn't ever have to ask someone to upgrade. They shouldn't even know that you're doing all this fancy stuff. They just they say, oh, website, website fast. Use website, happy. But maybe with more words. Cool. Um, just back on the web uh, responsive uh, web design, your slides about what was to be designed first or the the first, like mobile first, like do you mean mobile first or is it, because you said like all things are first, so I'm not too sure, uh, yeah. I mean maybe, I mean maybe you actually mentioned it but I just didn't understand, but what, where do you start when you want to build a responsive site? 
<laughs> Did you catch the question at the back? No. Um, so if you're doing a first, I was talking about first all the things or all the things first. So where do you actually start? You know, it depends. Um, I like starting with the content because that's the stuff that's going to inform a lot of your other choices. If you're going for a, an image heavy site, you're going to be thinking about things in a very different way than if you're going for a text heavy site. Um, so getting real content as early as possible is key to making the right desi design decisions, but often you can't. So don't, don't Laura Mipsum it, but if you can get the right kind of shapes at first and then keep bugging the content people and vice versa to get the content in as quickly as possible, then start with that. It's tricky. It depends. <laughs> um, but ideally, like a lot of people were talking about yesterday, start with the slices. So start with wireframing a very small piece and then start getting in some text and then start doing some HTML and CSS wireframes or prototypes and then kind of start going from there. Kind of. Uh, we'll chat at lunch more. It's good? I just want to find out, do you have any tools that you recommend for testing? Um, because I find that's the challenge for responsive web design. And also, is there a particular framework that you recommend that sort of like covers when you're developing? Because to do, I'm sure you know, the whole media queries all the time, it, it just becomes a waste of time. So is there tools for testing you would recommend and also is there like a framework you think covers everything and does it properly? Thanks. So that was about uh, how do you do testing and are there any frameworks I recommend? So I'll, I'll answer in reverse. Uh, frameworks uh, not really, not so much, but looking at things like Twitter Bootstrap and Zurb's Foundation can give you lots of cool ideas, and you can basically steal the best bits and combine them into a thing that works best for you. Um, in terms of testing, there are, there are loads. I'll we'll chat over email. To, I'll send you a complete shed load of links. Um, but just off the top of my head, one that's really good is webpagetest.org.com. I think it's .org. org. Org. It's very good. You give it a URL and it runs a, a whole bunch of stuff where you can go, ah, okay, cool. Fast here, slow here, that kind of thing. Um, but, and this is a chance for me to pimp another community thing that I do, woo! Uh, devicelab.co.za um, is a, it's an open device lab. It's a collection of um, phones, tablets, and, and other weird things. And it's a free thing that I run to, the, to people that want to use them. Um, and it, the idea is grab it, test it, see how it works on an actual phone. So emulators and things are fine, and doing the responsive shuffle with your browser is, is o very okay-ish as a start, but the best way to test it is on an actual device. That answer some of it? 